Yeah. Alfred Eugene Curtis, uh, I'm 83 years old, and I was in the U.S. Marines. Where you went, you where you were for training, and before well, you went to the war, what happened? The reason I joined, I was dyslexia, so all my life, at that time, they didn't know much about it. So in other words, I can't even spell the date. But when my brother came home from the Marine Corps boot camp and he was telling me what was happening, at that time, President Truman was fixing to do away with the Marine Corps. People didn't realize that. There's only graduating one platoon a week out of MCRD. But when he told me what they did, I mean, they could get you up at 3 o'clock in the morning those days, knock you around, do anything they pleased. And uh, I had to see that, so that's when I joined. And I went to San Diego here to boot camp. Then, when did when did you find out that you'll be going to Korea for the Korean War? Well, obviously, I got in boot camp in '49. In uh, going through boot camp, I wanted to go to sea school, which is uh, you know on a ship or in passenger or something like that. I was the only one recommended for it, but they decided to put me in a different category. So I went through a lot of different training for. Uh, communications, a lot of different specialties, you know. And so when the Korean War broke out, obviously I was right here in San Diego. And that's when uh, my brother's here, to, well, I, I didn't ever meet him there, but it, they immediately sent him to Korea, the 1st Brigade, which is the first Marines over there. Uh, in doing your interview with Ruben, I thanked him many times without the World War II NCOs and officers, it's a good chance we would have been defeated immediately. Mm. So that was very, very important that, because World War II was, hadn't been that long, but most of our C NCOs and officers was combat veterans from World War II, made a big difference. Because when you're 18 and 18 years old, you have no idea what's really going on. Right, I see. Mm -hmm. um, when you first heard that you'll be going to Korea, how did you feel? Did you have like an idea of what it would be like? Well, first off, I don't think hardly anybody knew anything about Korea. Obviously, during World War II, I was growing up during that time, uh, you only heard about the Japanese and also the Germans. Uh, the last two years in World War II, I was in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they made the atom bomb, and I had to have a badge on to go outside of my house, you know. It was totally top secret at that time. So we came out to California right right between the Germans and Japan surrendering. And immediately they laid off many thousands of people. And so, like I said, as I got Marine Corps, when the Korean War started, I had no idea, never heard of Korea, to be honest with you, you know. Uh, so it's something different. And obviously being young and being a young Marine, you automatically think, well, we'll get over there and we'll take care of everything in a couple of months and be back home. You know, but obviously that's the way we're supposed to think, and we did. So uh, when I went to Korea, I, they took me up to San Francisco, put me on a, uh, a ship, I don't remember the name. I said, I'm dyslexia, I can't remember. I remember events very good, but I can't remember dates and places. So I knew that I uh, went to uh, Yokohama, from there went to, I think, Tokyo, took a train from there to Sasebo. And like a lot of people, they put you on a ferry and they take you at that time to Busan. Busan was about the only place open that wasn't controlled by the North Koreans at that time, you know. And so that was my first experience, you know, being over there. Yeah, then when you first got there, what was your impression? What was it like? My first impression, I'll never forget it, was a, a little boy. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I understand a lot more. But the civilians and the kids were so Uh, I adapt to stuff very quickly. I accept stuff. Nothing bothers me. But the, the people in South Korea, they suffered. 
What was your living conditions like? Since I was in, I had special training. I'm a high school dropout with dyslexia. I couldn't spell. Before the Korean War started, they immediately put me through a lot of training, communications, a lot of undercover things. I was teaching class with about 100 people from high school dropouts to college graduates. Don't forget. But when it, it started, they decided to send me to Korea. During Korea, during the combat period, I did three different things. I was on the, on the uh, El Dorado, which is the flagship in Korea. As an 18-year-old, I maybe may turn just 19, I was working for the three-star admiral, the top admiral in all of Korea. We had a small brain detachment with all, both all the officers and master sergeants. They was working with the admiral to do everything the Marines did in Korea. Although I was the youngest guy there, I ended up typing up coded message for the Admiral, stuff like that. Plus, later on, I was in naval gunfire and close air support. With naval gunfire, you're either talking to the ships to bring in, uh, in fact, that time in Missouri there, I think New Jersey, different ones, to where the targets was. And sometimes I'll be on the ship talking to people in the land. What I did mostly was close air support, naval gunfire. I mean, close air support would be talking to planes to bring them in on targets. The very first jet I talked to most of the time at that time, it was just the ADs, you know, a, 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 grill, a grill with machine, I mean, planes. The first jet I talked to, he didn't, he flamed out just as he let everything go and he crashed. Now, I don't remember exactly where it was at, but it was on the west side of Korea, and the mud flats goes out for thousands, I mean, for hundreds of yards. You couldn't even see the ocean. And uh, so I was involved in a lot of different things, you know, uh, with, with special detachments, and so I never knew where I was at or where I was going, you know. Uh, I don't remember the names of cities. I do remember, uh, obviously, Busan and Seoul. That's the main thing in Incheon, but to all the other little towns and villages, well, there's nothing there at that time, nothing, you know that. Uh, seemed like every time when you move back and forth, the civilians had to go back and forth too, you know, and so you can imagine what they went through. So did you have some interactions with the Koreans there? Yes, we worked with the Korean Marines at times. Uh, we worked with the uh, the British, the New Zealand, uh, Turk, the Turks. They're the meanest sum of guns I've ever seen in my life because they've been fighting among themselves for centuries. World War II, there's all guerrilla fighters. They was mean, you know. And so uh, we worked with the ROC, you know, which is the, the Korean Army too. But when you're very young, you just do what you're told, you know. And uh, so where we go and where we went, I, I have no idea. Um, just like Gordon was saying, did you did you have any um, Korean civilians that you took in to help them or? Certain people, every now and then I would I see that. A lot of people would help, you know, like a young boy or something like that there to, that would do stuff. But I was amazed how they picked up English in no time at all. They could speak better than I could. Oh. I mean. What Korea has done since the Korean War is unbelievable. They're world power now, you know that. And so they have a lot to be very proud of. Yeah. So what they've been through, don't forget, they just was occupied prior to that by the Japanese, and it goes back in history. So Korea was dominated by other countries and stuff for, for, for a long, long time. And so there was nothing there at the time when we was over there, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, hardly nothing. I only remember one paved road. You know. right. So, what do you think is your most maybe rewarding or most memorable kind of favorite memory from the war, if you have? Hmm. I've always been, without realizing it, my whole life interested in history, how things do. To me, this is like a history class. I've always been able to accept things the way they are. 
and a lot of people can't do that, you know. Uh, obviously, things are bad, but you've got to accept it and get along with it, you know. Uh, I, I can remember that it seemed to me that the, the weather over there was either the, the rainiest, muddiest there was, or so damn cold, it's unbelievable, or so hot. You know, in where it says, I know there are some good days, but it seemed like it, it, if you've been there, you know, it, the seasons, when it's cold, it's cold. When it's hot, it's hot. When it's dusty, it's dusty. When it's muddy, it's muddy. So, and without hauling no paved roads or nothing else, you can imagine uh, getting back and forth and getting around is not that easy. Um, yeah, the, what was maybe then your hardest time, something like the most difficult thing that you did there? I would say the hardest was uh, the coal. Mm -hmm. We was very lucky, being some of the first Marines there, we just got out of World War II, so everything we had was for jungle fighting or for hitting beaches. What saved me, the Army at first turned down the uh, rubber insulated boots. And so by that, I'm pretty sure that saved me from getting frostbite. And also, they had come out of the park, because so I couldn't believe how slight it was, it was a bit more warm. So the cold was really, really bad, you know, but you have no choice. That's why I think war is fought by young people. Not, you, know, <laughs> you can get through stuff like it a lot easier. Did other people get frostbite and they had oh, to maybe course, go oh, yeah. back home? Mm -hmm. I see. Um, any other, I don't know, battle stories or stories during the war that you want to share? Like it says, I don't remember the uh, different towns and stuff like that. I still, you know, I don't do it. Uh, three or four weeks ago when they came here and, and, and recognized all the combat veterans there in Korea. I had a a flag in Korea I haven't seen for about over 60 years. It was it was wadded up as a Korean flag silk. And I got it pressed because I couldn't do it by doing it myself. And then I had another big flag that was all the UN things, about 20 of some of my countries. And so I brought this up and showed it, and the person in charge of this, he had took several pictures of me and him together and stuff like that. He goes, I don't think he's ever seen that. He showed all of the countries and the flags of each country was over there yeah. that participated, you know, obviously uh, the, uh, the UN stuff. I do know at times the, the Australians and the English, they fought all the time among themselves. You don't get around that. Uh, the one thing I missed more than anything else was milk. One time we was close to a Australian outfit, and we traded the coffee to them for for some butter and stuff like that. They had flown in, believe it or not. So, uh, but these are things that don't usually don't happen, you know. By not smoking, I've never smoked, so I was able to crawl every pack of sea rations. You get five cigarettes. I always trade that for better food and for for different things. So that, that, that helped out too. I, so I had a choice of seat rations where if you're a smoker, people do anything to get a smoke. <laughs> then when did you return home? I came back by ship and we came to San Diego. Okay. I was out for two years, I'm, I'm about two months and I worked for the California Forestry up there, you know, after I got out. And they kept asking me, because I was the old man then, I guess I must have been in my, uh, I signed for three years. And my time was up when I was in Korea, so they extended for six months. And at the time I didn't know it, but by extending for six months, you didn't have to join the reserves when you got out. But after being out for, for about two months, the people kept asking me questions and stuff. And so I went back in for two years. And during that two years, I was, I wanted to go overseas because I'm a, I'm a very good gambler. I made a fortune in money. You don't have to cheat, you just gotta know the odds. Mm -hmm. And so 
I have to go overseas because I want to make sure I can be where I can do it. And they sent me to Hawaii instead. But if anybody's got any money there, you know, going on uh, past stuff like that. But during that two years, then I was flown back and forth to Korea every three months. I spent three months in Korea, two months R and R in Japan, and then back to Hawaii for three months and back to Korea. So I was doing stuff off and on for five and a half years all during the Korean conflict oh. from the beginning to the end. Do you think about the Korean War often? No, when I got out, after a while, I started a business. And I ended up owning the largest ambulance service in the county here, many medical supply stores and businesses. Although I can't spell, but I always had a good exec secretary. But during that time, Korea was owner, I mean Vietnam, and I did not know that a lot of people working for me was in the Vietnam War. Wow. I never thought about it, but since I've been at the veteran home for this over 14 years, been the first one to live here, stuff is going on like this all the time. This is the first interview I've done, only because George asked me, uh, and I've had probably two or three dozen times to do it. It's it's uh, it's just part of my life, you know. Uh, it's a it's a great way for a person coming out of high school on what he wants to do. I think being in the service, that, but when I got in, you had no idea there was going to be a war in a short period of time after that, you know. Right, right. But my my brother uh, was over there and he was involved in uh, the very first Marine to land over there. I mean. Oh from here, you call the brigade, and they immediately, when they hit Busan, they took off and pushed the North Koreans back. And uh, he was in Incheon, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Chosen Reservoir, and uh, he ended up dying later from his wounds. You know. But he came back to the States? Yeah, well, he got wounded several times, and oh. they patched him up, and okay. he stayed there the last time. It was so bad, they had to get him over to Japan for a short time, and then oh. they Bought the United States, you know, for the Oakland Hill Hospital there for quite a while. Okay. You know, recovered from that, and then a little later, he, yeah. he died from his wounds. What's his name? His name was John Curtis. John. Okay. He was only 13 months old than I was. All these men who fought and who served in the war, it's just incredible. In your own words, if you can just describe it in just a few words, this this wow. legacy that you guys have made and created. How, how can you describe it? What is it to you? What does this mean to you? Well, since I've been here, been involved in different things the South Koreans done that's honored us, you know, I mean, the military took uh, all the friend veterans down to the convention center and did a lot of things for us. Civilians of Korea has done the same thing. We just got through with another thing, in other words, they're so grateful, a lot of people in Korea, what they're doing. Obviously, most everybody living over there right now doesn't remember the war. They have no idea. Or maybe they do, they see in pictures and stuff. But what the country has done in such a short period of time is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. A lot of other countries have not done that. The South Koreans are very smart people. Uh, and I've been out the Japanese the same way, been in and out of Japan there. When I took the crane out of Tokyo to go down to Busan to get a ferry to go over, I mean to, to Sasebo to go to Busan, I drove through, uh, I remember I, on the train, I looked up, I went through, everything was destroyed in the place I was going through. I said, where is this here? And he said, Hiroshima. I said, it's impossible. Because I was at Oak Ridge when they dropped the first atom bomb, that's where they made a lot of that at. And they said, no one would be able to live in this town for a hundred years. I said, why are we driving through it on a train right in the middle through it at that time? So in that short period of time from in the World War II to the Korean conflict started, they must have learned a heck of a lot about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I remember sometimes I had the opportunity to be in places where some Korean Army generals were probably making up much more money than corporals or sergeants in the Marine Corps. And in certain battles, they want to use the atom bomb. And obviously, uh, 
the Marine officers were the people, you know, in there were not allowed. Obviously, they couldn't do it anyway, you know that. So that was interesting. The interaction I had with different outfits and different people over a period of time, you know, uh, very educational. Yeah. This is history, and good or bad, right or wrong, you know, it's still history, you know. Right. So. Any other message that you want to share with people that will be watching this later on? Well, I've told you, like, I think Reuben and any other veterans that helped us out in World War II without their support at that time, I have no idea what would have, what would have happened. It made a big, big difference. There's nothing like experience. When you're 18, 19 years old, you, and don't forget, this happened so fast. A lot of people was living a normal life, and sometimes months later, they're right in the middle of a map, you know, of conflict and stuff, and seeing things that they never dreamed of. And uh, but I've always been able to adapt immediately to any situation. Mm -hmm. I think that helped me throughout my uh, professional career too. You know, mm -hmm. the Korean people have been very grateful for what we did. The time is gone, but there'd be nobody there that remembers that. They all have pictures and certain things like that. And I think when this last thing that we had, the honor was for here home not too long ago is that a lot of young people obviously I think it was so no in China I guess it was doesn't realize the background the history of what we've done for that country mm -hmm. and so this why this guy I just came forward and uh, in recognizing all the peoples in combat in every country mm -hmm. you know and I think that's great but can you explain what this is well every year the Veterans Affairs and different ones had what's called the Golden Age Games. They bring in veterans around, the seniors from around the whole United States, including Hawaii and Alaska. And this one year they asked me, or everybody, there's over six, seven hundred people go every year in different towns throughout the United States, to, to bring a picture of what we looked like when we were in the service and our current picture. So I just made this up here. It's the same, similar face expression, too. <laughs> I, I didn't realize how thin I was then, you know. And, and Handsome he, young man. And here's a, another picture of a, of a, this is in Korea, I forgot exactly when, but I could see I'm a, a buck sergeant there. A lot of people did not have 45s. I was not a typical Marine flying with a, a Marine officer. I was with them sometimes. Now, a Marine officer, I mean, a pilot is totally different than a, a Marine that's on the ground. 100% different. And so at times I've gotten little planes, flew here and there. One time we went back beyond the lines to an Army unit and took a shower. And that was unbelievable, you know, when you're out there in the cold and dirt and stuff like that. That was really great. So, uh, anyway, it was a Interesting time. It, it was not all fun, but uh, it's. Uh, I would think I could adapt immediately to what's going on, and that's never changed.